This week has seen South Africa's President Cyril Ramaphosa visit communities affected by flooding and mudslides that have so far killed at least 51 people. Plus, Egyptian voters overwhelmingly approve constitutional amendments that could pave the way for President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi to stay in power until 2030. This is Africa Focus. Here's a peek of the stories in store today. Looming health crisis, Ebola survivors turn caregivers in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Betting on cotton, Malian government hopes to increase the value of its cotton crop. Improving infrastructure, it's full steam ahead for Mozambique's rail sector. I'm Lenny Rashid, and our sign language interpreter is Monica Mwangi. Now, before we get into the main stories, let's take a look at the news that made the headlines around the continent. Voting began on Saturday in Egypt for constitutional changes that will potentially allow President Abdel Fatih El Sisi stay in office until 2030 in changes that will also bolster the role of Egypt's powerful military. Security was heightened on the streets with security personnel and vehicles out in full force. Some voters say that Sisi has had a positive impact on the country, providing stability amid a period of uncertainty. Under Sisi, Egypt has witnessed a crackdown on dissent that right groups say is unprecedented in its recent history. Media and social media are tightly controlled. Opponents say the changes are being rushed through without proper public scrutiny. Officials say Egyptians from all walks of life were given a chance to debate the amendments and that all views were factored into the final proposals. His supporters say the changes are necessary to give him more time to compete major development projects and economic reforms. At least 2,000 people protested in Tripoli, Central Mata Square on Friday against Eastern Commander Khalifa Haftar offensive with some criticizing U.S. President Donald Trump phone call to the commander. We are in yellow vest protesters carried signs against the interference of foreign countries, including Egypt, France and Saudi Arabia, in Libyan affairs. The protest came after the White House said on Friday that Trump spoke by phone to Haftar early in the week and discussed ongoing counterterrorism efforts by the leader of a military assault in opposition to the country's internationally recognized government. At least seven people had been killed as of Tuesday, a day after Trump called to Haftar. The current death toll is not known. Mali's Prime Minister Somelu Bobiemaiga and his whole government resigned on Thursday, four weeks after a massacre of some 160 Fulani herders by an ethnic vigilante group shocked the nation. While acknowledging the Prime Minister's resignation, a statement from President Ibrahim Bobakar Keita gave no reason for the departure of Maiga, but legislators had discussed on Wednesday a possible motion of no confidence in the government because of the massacre and failure to disarm militias or beat back Islamist militants. The March 23 killings by suspected hunters from the Dagon community on Ogosagau, a village in central Mali populated by river Fulani herders, were bloodly even by the recent standards of Mali's ever worsening violence. About 150 people are missing after a boat sank on a lake in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. Delphine Birimbi, a local activist in South Kivu province, told the media that the boat which had departed from neighboring North Kivu province, wrecked on the lake near Kalehe territory. He said three bodies had been recovered, that three people had been rescued, and another 150 passengers were missing. Deadly boat accidents are common in Congo, a vast forested country which has few roads outside of major towns and where boats are frequently loaded well beyond their capacity. Protesters gathering in the streets of the Sudanese capital Khartoum on Saturday brought a new and colorful element of the political action, face paint in the colors of both the old and modern day Sudanese flags. Combined nations of blue, yellow and green for the old flag and red, green, white and black for the current one adorned the faces of many protesters. The crowd featured a group of women who chanted together holding up signs calling for an end to the oppression of women. Hundreds of thousands of protesters must around a seat in outside Sudanese Defense Ministry on Friday to demand that the military council that hosted former President Omar al-Bashir last week hand over power to civilians. The military council has said a transitional period of up to two years will be followed by elections and that it is ready to work with anti-Bashir activists and opposition groups to form an interim civilian government.
Another Ebola outbreak is ravaging the Democratic Republic of the Congo, but survivors of the virus are doing their best to give a helping hand. As their bodies are now immune to the virus, many of the former patients are volunteering to help comfort the sick in hospitals across the vast country. Wearing only scrubs and a hairnet, Jeanine Masika cuddles a two-year-old Ebola patient in her arms and offers the listless toddler sips of water out of a plastic bottle cup. To avoid infection, most caregivers must don a protective suit, including a surgical mask, goggles, hooded coveralls, rubber boots, and two pairs of gloves. The outfits are hot and cumbersome, especially in the stifling tropical temperatures of Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, limiting the time healthcare workers can spend with patients as they fight for their lives in isolation units. But Masika was infected herself and now has immunity. The 33-year-old mother of six can spend entire days with patients at a treatment center in North Kivu, town of Beni, offering a comforting presence among a crowd of faceless figures with names written on their suits in marker pens. The work that I do, taking care of these children, is because I am a parent with children at home and I would have liked it if someone took care of them while I was ill. They cannot be with their parents because of this disease and I pity their situation. That is why I care for them and even when their parents get better, they still look at me like their parent. Masika is one of the dozens of survivors who are providing care and much-needed human contact to some of the littlest victims of the second worst Ebola epidemic on record. Of more than 1,200 confirmed and probable Ebola cases, 29% are children. According to the figures from the World Health Organization, more than 760 people, including at least 248, are under the age of 18, have since died since the outbreak began in August. Ebola claimed 10 of my family members. We did not know from the onset about Ebola and thought it was just regular illnesses and flu. My uncle became sick first, then my parents went to look after him, then he died. Our parents in turn unknowingly came back infected, then became sick and in our bid to try to treat and care for them, got infected. They died and in the end we lost 10 people whilst infecting each other and four of us survived. It is hard enough for the mother to be ailing and taking care of a child too interferes with the treatment. That is why we try to take off that pressure from the mother and I will do this work until Ebola is no more in Butembo. Masika lost 10 relatives to the virus. Four of those infected in her family survived. She spent 21 days at the same treatment center where she now works, battling horrific symptoms. Masika's experience inspired her to join the fight against Ebola, comforting the sick and frightened children who have to be isolated from their families and familiar surroundings to avoid infecting others. She's one of at least 23 former patients employed at the center in Beni, which is run by the Alliance of International Medical Action, Alima. And the children we keep, we meet all his needs. If it's clothes, we give him milk and even feeding it solid food. There is provision for everything they need. These women who look after our babies as we get tested give 100%. I appreciate them. The kids and, uh, and, uh, and the mothers are the ones who, who are more frequently visiti visiting the health facilities. And if the health facilities are unsafe, uh, because they, when there is a case, they deal properly with it. If they use injections not, in, not, not safely, etc., uh, etc., et then uh, they may contaminate other kids. Children are especially vulnerable to the virus. Ebola typically kills around half of those it infects, but more than two out of every three children sickened in this outbreak have died. According to Reuters' calculation, others were orphaned or left on their own when their parents went into treatment.
Masika whispers goodbye to her patients at the end of her shift and hands them over to other caregivers. She then leaves the cube to disinfect herself with chlorine solution and changes back into regular clothes. But the day is not over. Walking purposefully out of the center, she says she's headed to a hospital. One of her own children is sick with malaria and needs her care. Mali has reclaimed its place as the leading African country in terms of cotton production. The product makes up almost a quarter of Mali's exports and some 40% of the income of the rural population. But very little of Mali's cotton is processed in Mali for further use, a tendency that some view as a problem. It's early in the morning in this corner of southeast Mali, but the local farmers are already hard at work, harvesting cotton fibre from the fields. They take great care in the work. Cotton, often called white gold, is the country's primary export product. The industry is supported by the Malian government, which offers loans to cotton farmers. It's helpful because the people who grow cotton get fertilizer. On the other hand, those who do not do so have difficulty accessing fertilizers, even if they have money. Sometimes we also grow corn in addition to cotton. But only a small part of this harvest will be processed in Mali. Cotton is usually directly exported without being treated. It's a tendency that Marianne wants to change. Her shop in Bamako uses traditional strips of fabric and handmade yarn to make 100% organic cotton clothing. I'm committing to processing it here, not exporting it in a raw form. There are techniques, a certain craftsmanship. It's a real social, cultural and patrimonial issue. It's a shame that these things are not valued. Comatex is the country's only cotton processing plant. It deals with just 1% of the country's production, and strong competition from abroad means that business is tough going. Apparently, we think it's a great market textile. They say it's a big textile market, but it's also a market which is flooded with imported textiles which are cheaper. That seriously disrupts the company's business. With 728,000 tons produced in 2018, Mali is Africa's leading cotton producer. The main potential for growth in the sector now lies in ensuring that more of that raw produce is processed at home. Coming up after the break. We are in Cairo to find out about his social development over the past century through his old Siwa covers. We're about to pay some bills. Don't touch that dial. Welcome back. In case you just joined us, you're watching Africa Focus. Today's sign language interpreter is Monica Mwangi. Now, in recent years, the Mozambican government has made developing the train network a priority as part of its economic plan. But mounting public debt has meant that authorities had no choice but to cede control of the project to the private sector, providing little comfort for passengers. In 2005, Brazilian mining giant Vale, along with the Japanese conglomerate Mitsui began its Mozambican rail venture. It now operates a network of 1,350 kilometers following an investment of nearly $5 billion. It's 3 o'clock in the morning at Nampula Station in central Mozambique, another overcrowded train heading 350 kilometers towards Kuamba. It will be a suffocating journey of more than 10 hours, even for those who boarded early enough to get a seat. We can't stand it anymore. There aren't enough carriages and there are too many people. The train is always full. There's not enough room. The Mozambique government has prioritized rail development in recent years, but mounting public debt forced the authorities to cede control of the project to the private sector. This line's operator, CDN, is owned by Brazilian mining giant Vale and Japanese conglomerate Mitsui. Since 2005, it has restored the former colonial line, which linked its inland coal mines with the port at Nakala. It now operates a network of 1,350 kilometers, following an investment of more than 4 billion euros. 
We've had very positive growth from 2016 to 2017. In terms of goods, we saw an increase of 65%. We carry 400,000 tonnes a year. And in terms of passenger traffic, we've recorded the largest increase of 275%. But economic success has not translated into increased comfort for passengers since the company's focus is on its more profitable commercial operation. Today the Nakala line only exists because of coal, but once the mine is closed, what will justify the continuation of operations? Eight new rail corridor projects are now underway in Mozambique, all funded with the private capital of large companies, attracted by the country's vast mineral wealth. Yet whether their interest in the sector will continue for the long haul is as yet unclear. Scientists in South Africa recently launched the world's first optical telescope linked to a radio telescope. It hopes to combine the eyes and ears to try and unravel the secrets of the universe. When fully operational in the 2020s, the SKA will comprise a forest of 3,000 dishes spread over an area of a square kilometer across remote terrain in several countries to allow astronomers to peer into space and unparalleled depth. Reaching for the stars, this new telescope in South Africa's remote Karoo Desert is a unique opportunity for scientists to unravel the secrets of the universe. It's been conceived as the eyes of the 64-dish Meerkat radio telescope located 200 kilometers away. The final project will be part of the Square Kilometer Array, or SKA, the world's most powerful radio telescope system. So for the first time, I'm told, globally, you will have a dedicated uh, telescope that will track uh, a radio telescope so that if there are discoveries that are being made in the radio telescope, you'd be able to make follow-up. The new telescope takes extremely high resolution images of what the other telescope observes, allowing scientists to follow the astrological event underway. And the reason we do that is because that information tells us much more than just the one or the other channels. Professor Groet comes from Radboud University in the Netherlands, one of the three countries involved in the project. He hopes to witness explosions of supernovas or dying stars. The explosions are like stars that are at the end of their lives and all of a sudden they light up for a brief time. Maybe for a few hours, maybe for a day, maybe for a week. So we have a very limited amount of time to gather the information and learn what really happened in that universe. The mystery of space has haunted us since the dawn of time. And the answer might one day be found here, in Africa, the cradle of humankind. Cairo's social developments over the past century have been uncovered through the prints and engravings of old Siwa covers on display at an exhibition at the heart of the Egyptian capital. Cairo Siwa covers featured 36 photographs of Siwa covers and one life-sized prototype. Artist Salman Nassar, a teaching assistant at the American University in Cairo, developed an archive of photographed Siwa leads, geographically documented throughout some of Cairo's main districts, downtown Masrel Gedida, Mahdi and Zamalek. Her findings led her to introduce a new concept to Cairo's tax social divide, namely the privilege of having the service of sewage. The districts were chosen for their architectural homogeneity, according to Nassar, and hence for the greater probability that the inhabitants would share similar class standings. The Siwa is the conscience of the city. This is something that is very political. This goes back to the history of who was first granted the sewage service, who the service was first planned and operated for. This was first granted to the strand of 100,000 people living in Cairo at the time. 50,000 of them were foreigners and 50,000 of them were wealthy Egyptians. As such, the priority was always given to the upper class. Um, Nassar's project, which took flight in 2016, drew her into a whirlpool of Siwa covers throughout Cairo, each varying in shape and size, but most importantly in print and engraving.
This Siwa cover can also explain to us what types of information Siwa covers in Cairo or in Egypt can provide us. The first thing is who established the Siwa when Siwa where it was found, its date, and usually there is a symbol and a date written, such as 1950 or 1952. So, so this is an example of the kind of information that the Siwa cover can give us. In 1904, Nasar explained that the idea of sewage system was first introduced in Cairo. However, its execution was a failure until 1909, when several engineers competed to solve the comorbid problem of sewage and cholera in Egypt. Many of these sewer leads have history and they are dated. I've seen in India some of them are during the time of British or during the time of even when the Arabs came to India. So I see such old deaths and companies. So similarly, it is a great book of work. It is a great book, great book of work. Nasser continues that the sewage system was up and running in 1914 when an English engineer who initially introduced the sewage system in Mumbai, India, was brought to execute the plan in Egypt. A key focus of Nasar's exhibition are the maps produced throughout her research, maps which she says are political documents, weapons of development, as well as sources of knowledge. In a country divided by ethnic and religious strife, the National Center African Ballet is a rare unifying factor, a melting pot professing no favoritism or allegiance to any group or sect. Like the costumes, the dances, and the music are a mixture of traditional cultures from the 16 different prefectures of the strife-torn country, two-thirds of which are under the sway of some 18 armed groups. The sound of music rings out across the National Museum in Bongi. Twice a week, men and women come together here to showcase the cultures that make up the Central African Republic. The country may have been plagued with ethnic and religious unrest in recent years, but the National Ballet is trying to be as representative as possible. It's an arts organization comprising every ethnic group in the CAR with dances from the 16 regions. The ballet was founded in 1969 under President Jean Bedel Bokassa and aims to be truly national. But civil war in 2013 and 2014, plus fighting in Bangui, left the country with no institution to push the arts. The National Museum has even been ransacked. This arts organization is facing practical difficulties because of lack of funding and financial support. A lack of resources may make it difficult for the ballet to get its performers together, but the show still goes on in the hope of a better future. On Africa Focus, we love hearing from you, so make sure you get interactive with us on our various social media pages. Remember, you can view this program along with a wide array of other programs on DSTV Channel 268 and on Azan TV Channel 138. On behalf of the entire team here on Africa Focus, thank you for keeping us company on this exciting journey. Enjoy the rest of your viewing.